What's up, Chaga addicts? This is Steven from Phantology, bringing you another First Law episode. This is a discussion of Little Hatred, and I have Alex from A Hero's Journey on to join me this time. So how's it going, Alex? Happy to have you back. We covered Blood Song. Oh, gosh, maybe that was a month or a month or two ago now, but I know we both really liked this one. Yeah, that was about two months ago, and thanks for having me on again. It's great to be back um, on Phantology, and I think I enjoyed this book a little more than Blood Song, so I'm very excited to talk about it with you. Yeah, I think I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb here and say, not only is this my favorite first law book that Abercrombie's written, it's my favorite book that I've read in 2020. So oh. pretty high praise from me coming wow. up. Oh, that is that is very high praise. I I can't go that far. Um, I did enjoy this a lot. And I think it's this takes a step beyond what we were experiencing in the first law, like the first trilogy. It's a little more brutal, a little darker, and I, I am all for it. It's It's amazing. So I'll say maybe that's high praise, or it might just indicate how little I actually get to read. <laughs> Well, well, I guess we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, I, I agree to an extent, although I think in some ways maybe it's not as dark because it seems like, I mean, this is the first book of a trilogy, so we'll see where the characters go. But it seems like some of these characters have more potential for good than the characters we knew from the first trilogy, like Logan and Glockta, for example. I mean, it's basically the Grim Reaper and the Bloody Nine, who's just a complete devil spirit almost. And here we have some characters who have some more prominent good qualities, I would say. Well, we'll see where the series goes, but I could see it being like maybe not quite as dark. The action is still dark, but the spirit of it maybe. This is where I think it's darker than the first, like the original trilogy. Because these characters are more innocent, I feel like it, there's more impact when these dark things happen to them. And we go into dark darkness almost immediately in this book. It's The, the characters will not stay innocent for long. It, it's not possible. Yeah, I, I, I guess I don't expect that. I mean, you know what you're kind of getting into going into an Abercrombie book. But oh, maybe yeah. I have some hope that some of them might have things turned out okay for them. I really like the characters, so I'm always wishing for the best, but maybe I, maybe I need to be more realistic, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you always need to be more realistic. So before we uh, jump into full plot point spoilers, let me do a, a plug for Phantology, and then uh, I'll give you some time, Alex, to let listeners know what, what a hero's journey is doing. So at Phantology, we cover the full uh the full realm of the fantasy the the entirety of the landscape of fantasy books out there anything from abercrombie like this one to wheel of time to stormlight to dresden files and if you're interested in any of those things check us out uh, we have several episodes now and please join our discord and chat with us more and now uh alex let the uh let everyone know how they can find you guys at a hero's journey and what you guys are doing yeah so you can find us where a heroes a heroes journey podcast. You can find us on Twitter at a underscore heroes underscore journey, and we we talk about the same type of books as Phantology, but we try and look at different characters through the lens of the hero's journey and do a little debate club, see how characters hit or miss steps on the journey. We recently had an episode on the Great Hunt. And we're going to be talking about L'Oreal by Garth Nix next. And are you guys covering Aragon as well? I think I saw a few tweets yeah. with some quotes and, and things. Yeah. So that episode just came out on September 8th. So very recent. If you don't know, Christopher Pellini is going to have a new book to Sleep in a Sea of Stars, which comes out actually this Tuesday. And I right. was just okay. Okay. very excited to read some of his stuff again. So we went back to Aragon. It was pretty fun. And that's more sci-fi, right? His new book? Yes, his, his new book is like, I think, fairly hard sci-fi. Uh, I haven't read it yet, obviously. It's not, it's not out yet, but I'm excited for it. Interesting. I mean, he published Aragon when he was like 
what, 12? I think it was more like 16. Uh, he started writing when he was 16, published when he was 19. Okay, okay. Uh, I knew he was young, but he hasn't published anything for years now. It's It's been a while. Yeah, this is his first new book. He He had a collection of short stories like two years ago, but first full-length novel since Inheritance. And I've been on one of your one of, one of your hero's journey reviews as well. We were talking about the belly of the whale, and that was a really fun conversation. So please check out a hero's journey and give them all the love that they deserve. But let's talk a little hatred now. So if you haven't read the other first law books, like please don't read a little hatred. Please read the other ones first. Yeah. You could read the book like on its own and enjoy it probably because it's really good but you're not going to pick up on a significant chunk of inside jokes and cameos and significances of plot points unless you've read the original trilogy. And then also you need to read the standalones. And you should probably read the collection of short stories as well for the full experience. But if you're just like bound and determined to read the book, I guess I can't stop you, but I would not recommend that. Yeah, so I haven't read The Heroes or Red Country. I've read everything else in that universe. So I think that there are things that I missed. For example, Clover, I got the feeling that I was supposed to know who he was, and I I didn't. Actually, no. No? Actually, Clover, uh, he does not appear anywhere in the first seven seven published works. Correct me if I'm wrong there, someone, but I'm, I'm fairly certain. At least according to the wiki, that's what it says. Because I had the same question. But uh, if you didn't read, okay, but if you didn't read The Heroes or Red Country, there are definitely some things that you missed. And and I'll I'll make sure to avoid spoiling those because I imagine you'll go back and read those eventually. So that is good to know. Oh, definitely. Yeah. But I agree with you. If you haven't read at least the original trilogy, and I think Best Served Cold was a really important one because of Call Shivers being in this book again i i really yes. enjoy his character and maybe like a tiny spoiler but shivers appears in the other the other standalones as well so his character gets kind of fleshed out over those three books and the heroes deals with the battle of Ostrung, which they reference a few times that's where like calder is coming from who's a pretty significant character the calder and scale really are built out there you see a lot more of uh, of Gorst there, Bremer and Gorst, yeah. and Red Country is maybe not as plot essential to this one yet. It takes place out in the far part of the the world, out west, in some of the uh, the uncharted lands out there. But I think it might be more important going forward. So that one maybe not as essential yet. But the heroes, yeah, you probably missed a few things. But that, I mean, you you got the majority. I'm assuming you love the book. Yeah. Like I said before, I think there were some references that I probably missed, but I was able to still pick out, like, Baez is there, and his w- other wizards and mages are in, in there. And I got all the references, well, I'll say almost all the references to the first trilogy. So I, it's a lot of fun to pick this up in the future and see how things have developed. Yeah, I love that way of writing the advancement of technology and the moving forward of time and the idea that things are changing. I think a lot of authors like to do that. Uh, Most prominently comes to mind is Mistborn from Era 1 to Era 2, when Era 2 is like the steampunk setting after the more traditional fantasy setting. I mean, it's still a very unique setting in Mistborn, but that advancement's really cool. Yeah, this feels much more grounded in realism, though. It's a very slow grind, and it, it it mirrors what happened in you know the real world with this slow progression from people working in the fields to going to cities and working in the cities to having more manufacturing. And that they seem to be at a very basic level of manufacturing in here, but it it feels realistic. Yeah, and they uh, there's some his like I think there's one part where it says something about a wheeled carriage being developed. I assume we're talking getting into like steam powered trains, et cetera. Uh, canals are being dug. Manufacturing, like you say, is is all the rage now. You see a little bit of that in the heroes, actually, with some technological advancements. 
that are happening, but it's been at least 30 years, 30 plus years since the original trilogy. So that difference is really nice. So rather than talk through the plot straight through like we sometimes do at Phantology, I thought we'd kind of take this in a few different chunks here. So I wanted to start with the character POVs. Let's just talk. We have seven main character points of view. Let's talk about who we liked, who we didn't like, what who they are a little bit, what significance they might have. And then at the end, I want to rank these seven in terms of our favorites and see how we stack up. This is something we did on our Discord, and we had a lot of different submissions, so that was kind of fun to see. So there are four, I would say four like main POVs in Savine or so, Rika and Leo. And then you have three that are a little more minor in Vic, Clover, and Broad. Maybe, you know, fight me there if you're a huge fan of one of the minor three that I just said. So let's but let's start with Savine. So Savine, Dan Glockta, the daughter of old sticks of of Glockta from the first trilogy, or not really the daughter, but the adopted daughter. That's obviously a huge plot point going forward. Savine is described as the most beautiful and meticulous woman in the union, and she is incredibly ruthless and cunning, much like her father. The apple didn't fall too far from the tree on that one. So, Alex, like, what, what are your impressions of Savine? How do you like her? So, I think Savine is an amazing character. I will say, one of the things that I missed was I didn't remember that Savine was actually Giselle's daughter oh so that was like a huge revelation for you when that happened yeah it was a revelation i was not expecting it at all and it made the book a little bit weird at that point because of what we should just address this now probably the incest um yep yep yeah (laughs) i'm super glad that savine was disgusted by this once she found out uh i was a little worried we were gonna have another jamie and siri and Seriously. Yeah. yeah. So I'm glad that she was disgusted. There was like a second in in the book where she was considering just ignoring this fact, but uh-huh. she decided that she couldn't, which is the right decision. I mean, hopefully, but there are, there were a few times at that uh, at the parade, the festival at the end where she's like, man, I just wish I still had Orso. And that's maybe that's natural, but I don't know. I I do think he's not going to go the incest plot line because you can't do it again. Yeah. But it, it is interesting that he did kind of do it again. Yeah, it's hinted at. I I think that Savine has definitely like gone away from this. The quote from her is he was lost to her forever and the person she had been with him was lost forever and she could not even tell him why. So she's totally done with it. Hopefully Orso can move on from this. He's going to have trouble, though. He doesn't know why, right? Like, if I was Orso, I'd still be, like, fighting to get her back a little bit. Yeah, I think I think that he's too realistic and too... I, I don't know how to say this, because I like him as a character, but he's not as motivated in that way. He's more go with the flow, so I think he's just gonna kind of like float on. He's yeah, obviously broken up about it happening, but just because of his characterization, I don't see him dwelling on her for a very long time. I agree to an extent. I mean, he was totally in love with her, so it's gonna be hard. But I do think that yeah, he's maybe not quite as motivated in any one direction. And now, I mean, let's just address this as well with Giselle dying at the end of the book. The only who actually knows, right? It's just Savine and Adi and Glockta that actually know this is true, right? Yeah. That Unless be Therese everybody. somehow knows, but I, I kind of doubt it. Maybe maybe Baez knows. It seems like this might be something like Baez is got out of Glockta or, or some other way. Of, I mean, he knows everything. Baez definitely knows because Glockta is afraid that he will use that to manipulate Savine. Oh, in that conversation they have at the very end? Yeah, because she's still the firstborn son of the king, firstborn child of the king, obviously not son. So there is concern that Baez will manipulate her. I wouldn't even say it's concern. It's almost 
guaranteed that Bias is going to manipulate her somehow. Although, dang, may, do we need to go back and look at this? Because I don't remember. Does Glockta tell her, don't tell Baez what you know, like keep this under wraps, or he will use this? Or is he saying he already knows, say no to anything he says to you? That's a good question, and I don't, I don't know. We'll have to throw this one over to Discord. This is going to be a pretty important plot point, I would say, going forward into the next book. But yeah, I, I, I really want to know that now. So aside from this, one of the things that I really like about Savine is how she changes during her time in Valbeck, the fallen city. Instead of like gaining more sympathy for the poor, she decides to distance herself further from them, which I think is interesting. It's not what you would typically see with a fantasy character who spends time among the poor who had been, you know, a privileged princess, essentially. She distances herself from everything afterwards, right? Like she is in a way bad state at the end of this book, just spiraling out of control. Oh yeah, she is like actually traumatized and starting to come to terms with this. I, it's definitely going to take a while. I mean, my question is, will she be able to come to terms with it? Because it doesn't seem like there is anyone in her life that is going to help her get there. Everyone that's close to her. I mean, I think if Orso wasn't her brother, half-brother, that this relationship would have pulled her through it but without that i mean i don't think leo dan brock is going to offer the emotional help that she needs right now no i don't think leo is capable of that at all um <laughs> definitely not <laughs> so just briefly kind of went through the text to see if we could find the answer to that and it seems like Baez probably has to know just because he's Baez, but it's not explicitly stated one way or the other from glockta we'll see i think maybe that's something we look for going forward into the trouble with peace. So for me, Savine, Savine is probably, I mean, spoilers for our rankings, but Savine is probably my favorite viewpoint character. And that might be because I just love how ruthless and breathtakingly beautiful she is. And I probably have a crush on her. <laughs> so that's going to help out. But by the end, I'm fairly concerned where she's going. And I'm concerned about my level to continue to root for her if she gets more and more ruthless in the next book. I thought putting her into the slums of Valbeck was the perfect choice for her character and then bringing her back out in a way where she didn't really change in the direction we would want her to change as a human. She got even worse and now she's spiraling out of control. This sets up a lot of it, we're we're stocking up a lot of gunpowder here, I guess, for the next book. Oh yeah, and I, again, spoilers for our rankings later. But <laughs> Savine is also my favorite character. I, for the same reasons that you said, she's beautiful. She's effective. She is the best at what she does. And now I am excited to see her continue on whatever direction. Glockta was my favorite character in the original trilogy, and same she here, is. Yeah. He is evil, but he is interesting. So I'm excited to see that going forward. Yeah, Glockta, I loved his internal monologue so much. The best part of the books for me. Oh, yeah. Okay, so going from Savine to Orso, her half-brother lover on the down low. So what do you think of Orso? Orso is maybe more of like a divisive character. I really liked Orso. I think that he is fun. He reminds me a lot of Giselle in the first book, in The Blade Definitely. itself. And I think that he has the potential to be the best character of all of our seven main characters. I think he has the most potential to be a good person at the end of this. Um, I think it's unlikely that he will be, but I think he has the most potential to be. I agree with that. He has a lot of qualities buried deep deep below the surface of his foppish ineffectual crown prince facade and he knows that he is kind of this you know bumbling fool that spends time in drink and in whorehouses 
and he recognizes that and he just kills himself with it. But when he actually does attempt to do things, he, he does them fairly well. I mean, the uh, the whole negotiation of Valbeck was handled well until he failed to like follow up on his on the Inquisition there and they hanged everyone. So not perfect, but it's a step in the right direction at least. So I'm hoping for good things for him. I will say at the beginning, I did not like Orso at all. And people that I was chatting with the book about were a little outraged about this because they all love him. And by the end, I'm with you. I do love Orso, but it took me a while to get there. And it probably wasn't until he started doing some things effectively that I that I uh, changed my mind on him. Yeah, so the, one of the first effective things he does is get the, his campaign together because he sees the injustice happening in England and he's like, I can go help them. I can help fix this issue. So he goes around, and I love this series of scenes where he's going to all the different people on the closed council and they're like, this yes. is an issue of politics. This is an issue of money. Yes, fantastic chapter. I feel bad for him that he he failed, but I knew that from the beginning. He he's never going to be able to succeed in this grim dark world where Baez is controlling everything. But I do like how much he tried and how, how much like legitimate effort he put in when it when is it wasn't really expected from his introduction of this foppish drunk and how amazing is it that he has no idea how any of these things work? And this is his first attempt to negotiate and navigate the bureaucracy ever in his entire life. And he's so innocent. And he's like, what? You can't just make this happen? I can't believe it. Yeah. He uses that to his advantage, actually, at the in his negotiations. He's like, I'm the crown prince. Um, I have learned that I have zero power. So I can make whatever promises I want. It doesn't matter because I have no power to follow through. So that's another thing. He is m- way more intelligent than you might expect being Giselle's son and the drunk at the beginning. So past or so, moving on to Rika. Rika is the daughter of the Dogman, one of our favorite members of the original crew, Logan's crew back in the day. And he's still around and kicking, which is more than most of his past friends can say Ricka has something called the long eye which is this new magical plot device that Abercrombie's throwing in here basically it's like the ability to see into the future and this is going to develop more and more throughout the book to the point where it's almost a hindrance for her and she needs to learn how to deal with it and it doesn't seem like she has any hope to do that right now because her Tudor Isern is really like not that effective in helping her with this magical power. Yeah, I'm honestly not convinced that her tutor has the ability to teach her. It just seems like Reich opens her eye by herself on accident. She is interesting to me that she can see the future, but besides that, I don't have a lot to say about her character. I feel like she didn't really change or grow much. She is just able to see the future. And that's about it right now. It seems like towards the end of the book, she was being set up for more change, especially with how upset she became with Leo for sparing Stour Nightfall's life and how vengeance and bloodthirsty she appeared to be. That was that honestly caught me off guard a little bit. I mean, we knew that she had some of these feelings from her time on the run and the fact that Nightfall had taken everything from her and burned Ufrith, etc. But all of a sudden, she's like zero to 100 right away, and she kind of keeps up that energy. So I'm interested to see where she goes. I really enjoyed the parts where she showed up at the party at the end and tries to interact with everyone. It, you know, she really just interacts with Orso Sabine and as well. Sabine. Yeah, just this dirty, stinking Northman that's showing up at this fine gathering of of upper crust society members. That's that's a tried and true trope that never really gets old for me. I love that. Yeah, I see that. I think that there's a lot of potential in Ricky to develop in the future. But for this first book, I think he's just setting up the character in an interesting way. And the development will come later. I, I really like 
character development. That's why I talk about it on my podcast every week. So I'm excited to see where she goes. Just not super excited about her character in this book. I can agree with that. I, th- I think maybe maybe I'm saying I saw a little bit more growth than you liked, but at the same time, I think the majority is going to happen into the future. So on to her sometimes lover, Leo Dan Brock, the young lion, the hero of England and the Battle of Red Hill. Leo is an interesting character in that he is like a lot of these guys in the series, very bloodthirsty, loves war, loves the idea of making a name for himself in the circle, etc., and building upon the legends of the Bloody Nine and all these other heroes. But at the same time, he's like a good fighter, but maybe not as good as he thinks he is. And he's quite arrogant and also just kind of dumb in general. Like he's very straightforward and has none of the subtlety that Sabine and Orso have. Those are essentially my thoughts on him too. I think I would have liked him more if Orso hadn't been there, but he has this like kind of bullheaded, I'm going to do what I think is right and not really listen to anyone else attitude, which is common, but not something I really like. And the other thing about him is I like this blending of the North and the Union culture in him. You know, he dresses like a union, he talks like union folk, but he's thinking more like a northerner, thinking, oh, I should win glory on the circle, fighting by myself rather than commanding the army and gaining money like a union person yeah. would. Which makes sense considering where he's grown up and where his protectorate is and who he's always kind of been eager to fight against. And like you say, I think that legacy of this northern culture of fighting and winning glory is 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 very prevalent and that makes a lot of sense and i'm curious to see if his eyes get opened to the monstrosities of war ever i was maybe expecting a little bit after the whole fight in the circle when he almost died but that didn't really happen and now here he is in adua in a different role in this like political role going forward in a role that he doesn't seem to be very well suited for at all. No, he's definitely not suited for it. And I think that his perspective is going to change a little bit. Starting from that fight, he's seen that showboating and showing off how how much prowess you have at combat is not an effective way to win the battle. If that was the effective way, Leo would have lost. But he has seen now that taking the opportunity and a little bit of trickery is what can help him win. So I expect him to put a little bit more of that into his fighting or at least try to in the future. And I guess we'll see if he's able to apply that into the fighting he's going to have to do in the social circles of Adua. Yeah. Politics. I I assume it's going to take him a little bit longer to find his legs there. Yeah. I I don't have a whole lot of hope from there. I think he's going to get totally outmaneuvered by this other trio of y- of young lords who are trying to uh, get him on their side. <laughs> yep, he's definitely going to be the figurehead. Um, <laughs> we'll see. So, so, so going pa- past these four main POVs, we have three minor ones. We have Vic, Clover, and Broad. And we can probably say a little bit about each of them, but probably not as much as, as our main four. So Vic, I really like the twist with her. When we found out that pretty early on that she wasn't a member of the Breakers, that she was in fact a member of the Inquisition, and her father was the the Lord of the Mints or whatever back in the day that Glockta sent off to the camps, and she has that. So I found her to be a very effective character that is not as built out as the other ones that we're still maybe looking for a bit more from. Yeah, I agree with you. She's not... at. Like, we don't spend as much time with her, but I think she still is a very interesting character. She's one of the stagnant characters as well, but I think her being stagnant is more interesting because we just have the short period of time. And we see her tricking the people she works, she is living with in Vaubeck and, like, essentially handing Vaubeck back to the Union without losing more lives. So, while she does work for the Inquisition, which is an inherently 
evil and corrupt group, she is also trying to do the best for the people around her. I'm sure it would have been easy for her to slip back into the Union by presenting that letter, basically the same letter, but saying, keep me with you and just destroy the city. So she does have more morals, and I really appreciate that. While she's still living in a very realistic manner in the grimdark world that Abercrombie created. Seeing her through Orso's eyes in that negotiation was really what made me appreciate her character more because Orso saw her as this incredibly intimidating and competent woman who's able to get him this note under the table and is playing both sides and doing it remarkably well. And then some of the conversations she has with Glockta as well make you realize that she is someone that you don't want to mess with. And I think initially, through her point of view, you don't get that quite as much. I also love how how much inner turmoil she has in trying to do the right thing but not being able to, especially this scene where she leaves behind Malmer, who's the breaker, who seems to be trying to protect the people like a basically good guy, and she might be able to help him, but she can't because you got to be realistic about some of these things sometimes. So past Vic on to Clover. So we don't get a whole lot about Clover. Jonas Clover. Sounds like you were thinking that he might have appeared in the previous books. I'm going to I'm going to stick with saying that he was not. I don't think so. At least and this is another one where not until the very end action do we get a whole lot of movement here. The way he was introduced, I was expecting that there was some back knowledge that I was missing because he's introduced as the like this grizzled warrior, but we get references to him being a champion fighter in the past. And I'm a little surprised that we didn't like we don't actually have that. But I guess it, it, it works. Clover is very interesting. He definitely relies more on his wits relies more on his wits now than on his fighting skills, but he definitely still has the the fighting skills. He is ruthless when he needs to be, and I like the intelligence and kind of how freely he moves between, how freely he moves his loyalties. He's willing to be loyal to Scale and Black Calder as long as he can, and then when the young wolf presents him a better opportunity, right there, he's, he's taking it, he's yeah. going to go with it. Yeah, how ruthless was that? I know people are quite upset at Clover. If you hadn't read the heroes, you probably don't have the same attachment to Wonderful that like I did. Like I was fairly upset how quickly he killed her because she's a pretty likable character. Yeah, I don't have the attachment, but I can see I can see where you're like not liking Clover as much because of that. Yeah, for the most part, he just kind of serves to be like our viewpoint into what's happening with Black Calder and Scale and Stour. So for that, I think that it's a little disappointing that he wasn't built out more. He just kind of seems to be like that way that we get what's going on in their plot. I imagine going forward, he will be and making this decision and now serving Nightfall. Who knows what's going to happen with the Norse? I see a lot of opportunities here for Clover. So our last POV character is Broad, Gunner Broad. A lot of people compare him to like a light version of Logan because of the brutal fighter that he is and how he's trying to keep that suppressed and do the right thing. He doesn't have the same bloody nine demon alter ego power, but there are some similarities. At the same time, he does have his family around him to kind of keep him grounded a little bit more broad was one where again there's like not quite enough here for me to really sink my teeth into and i imagine again future books we'll see more yeah i kind of agree with you i think broad probably had the least point of views but i think we were able to get a really good idea of who he is he was a family man a farmer before he left he did brutal terrible things while he was fighting in the wars and now he's bringing that back home so while he doesn't have the same like bloody nine alter ego, I do definitely see him as a parallel to Logan, the union parallel to Logan. I really enjoyed his character. I thought the way he just pulverized people and 
I love the scenes of him taking off his glasses to protect them because they're so valuable to him. Yeah, that was a fantastic small way that Abercrombie's showing the advancement of technology. Yeah, exactly. And then the tattoos on his hands, I'm really interested to find out what they mean. I, I understand a little bit like he means he's a ladder man and he's been first in the fight. But I wonder if they'll go back into this backstory about how he got them in later books. And I am really excited to see him work with Savine in the future. Yeah, Abercrombie doesn't do a whole lot of, uh, by way of flashback unless I'm forgetting something. But I, I would be interested to get more of, of what happened in Styria. I don't know that we will, though. It feels like he's just kind of moving forward and, and saying, yeah, those things happened and, and make up your own details. Yeah, that's not a bad thing. The, the mystery and making up my own details can, can work fairly well. Yeah, and, and we know enough about Styria and war in general, at least through the Abercrombie viewpoint, that we probably have an idea of what happened there. Yeah, I, I would agree. The last thing I want to say about Broad is the level of anxiety and stress that I had when he first pulled out the glasses and they talked about how valuable they were and how much he needed them, I was certain that they were going to break at some point because that just seems like so Joe Abercrombie to take away this valuable object from a character that we start to like. So I'm, I guess I'm still concerned that that's going to happen in the future. Well, if it does happen in the future, now he has a rich benefactor to buy him a new pair. That's yeah. That that's a good yeah. point. <laughs> okay, so maybe it's not. Maybe it won't be as much of a of a big deal unless he ends up without access to that money. Okay, so we spent a while on the characters. Let's kind of let's let's do our top seven here. So so I'll say my seven in order of who I liked the most to who I liked the least. I mean, I liked them all, but in terms of like whose viewpoints I enjoyed reading, I'm gonna say number one is still my girl Savine. Hope for the best for her going forward. Number two is Orso, and he really climbed his way up the rankings because, I, like I say, he started off really low. Number three, I'm going to say Vic. I think she was she has a lot to show me going forward, but she has, also has a lot of potential. I loved how capable she was. Number four, I'm going to say Rika, kind of the same thing. I, I like the long eye, long eye idea. Five is Leo. Ah, Leo kind of frustrates me. He's not He's not my favorite character. I'm going to be honest. And then six will be broad just because we didn't see enough of him. And then seven's Clover because I hate Clover now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we, we're actually a little different. Our first two are the same. Savine and Orso, I think, are my favorite. They are an amazing like dichotomy um, of effective and ineffective characters, but their internal monologues are great. Third for me is going to be Broad. I love this kind of like brawler fighter and I'm excited to see where he goes. Like I said, I think okay. we had a lot of backstory and a lot of insight into him, even though we don't have a lot of actual time on the page. I'm going to put Vic four. She's again, just interesting to me and I want to see her develop. I, I like the Inquisition uh, as corrupt and terrible as they are. So that's interesting. Clover is going to be five. And then Leo is six and Reich is seven. Uh, I wasn't as invested in the Northern storyline this time. And I think that if I have Savine and Orso, and then I compare them to Leo and Ricky, Savine and Orso are so much better in my mind that I lowered my opinion of those two. I think if they had been the solo like young leads, I would have liked them a little bit, a little bit more. I agree that the northern plotline was not quite as interesting. The battle the, the battle of Red Hill was fantastic and I was there for that, but the rest of it I wasn't quite as interested in compared to Valbeck and what was going on in the Union. Not to say that I didn't like what was going on. I mean, I I enjoyed the whole book quite a bit, but comparatively I I do agree with you that I the north was not quite as interesting this time around. Yeah, the last battle was great, but not enough to bring up the slower pace and just not as interesting characters to me. Okay, so those are our character rankings. I wanted to talk more about some plot points and then some themes, some general themes and ideas from the book. For sake of time, rather than talking through all the plots, 
let's just say we each get two plot points that we feel like are worth discussing more. I know we already talked about some, but I'll say my favorite chapter of the book, and I'm going to call this a large plot point, was the whole chapter with the lovers swap at the party towards the end. I loved the parallel structure that Abercrombie used when writing this because you got Savine's viewpoint, you got Orso's viewpoint, and you got Rika talking to both of them, and you got them thinking about things in the same way where they were looking over at other characters and thinking something like, oh, I don't blame... I think Sabine was talking was was thinking about this in terms of Celeste, and Orso was saying this in terms of Leo, and they said the same type of thing that was like, I, I don't blame them for acting this way because if I was in their shoes... I would. And so just this parallel, this parallel construction of the chapter was fantastic. And then it ends with them swapping lovers and going back and kind of breaking up all of the relationships that had happened thus far. So this chapter, I'm assuming you remember this one, like anything else worth mentioning? Oh, I should also say that uh, the fact that Savine gave Rika her very valuable, like, emerald necklace and then Orso is seeing it later like things like that that where you have more information than the characters that's really fun for me yeah um i agree the only other thing that i want to mention with this lover swap is uh leo is gay right unclear right like okay he's at least he's at least bisexual okay (laughs) that's where i was coming down on it like um almost from the first introduction of leo I was thinking, oh, this guy is gay, but I, I guess bisexual would also fit well for him. So it was interesting to see this lover swap and thinking, oh, both of these are going to fail, uh, just like the previous relationships they had failed uh, for different reasons. But I I can't imagine that these lovers are going to last for a very long time. Definitely not. And you already know, based on what Leah was saying, that his his little interaction with Savine was maybe not what he was expecting, and he already assumes that he was used. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so at least he's picked up on that much. He's not completely dense. So that that was probably my, I think that was my favorite chapter of the book. So anything, what, what stood out for you, Alex, as far as like the big plot point that you think we must talk about? So I don't know if this is a, big a plot point or just my favorite part so the chapter the machinery of state where orso is finally going to do something he's decided that he's going to raise this army to go fight in the north uh, we we know that he doesn't go fight in the north he goes to va back instead right but it's really like interesting to me to see this grind of him going to all of the different people on the close council and learning from each of them that there's a different reason why he shouldn't be going to fight in the North for Lord Marshal Brent. It's a question of money for the Lord chancellor. It's priorities, what he cares about more. And it's definitely not the North. And then for Glockta, it's politics. Is this going to be effective? And that I think has what happens in the real world as well. So it's really nice to see a fantasy world actually discussing things that are important to our real lives. Politics is definitely what drives a lot of events and people's decisions in the real world. And it's good to see that highlighted in a book as well. And Orso just doing this is one of my favorite scenes. I would say this Orso chapter and the chapter after he rescues Savine and they finally get together for real it seems like and he proposes marriage the chapter after that where he's in this great spirits and he thinks it's all going to work out and as a reader you're like this is not going to work out yeah (laughs) but seeing how excited he was for it and maybe you had a different experience reading this chapter actually since you uh since you didn't remember that they're actually not going to be together because of the incest plot line but for me reading that that was so perfect because the way that Abercrombie sets up this real dark humor and the juxtaposition between what the character's feeling, what you're, you as a reader are feeling, that's fantastic. For me, I was just thinking, 
I, I can't believe this worked out. I In the first chapters where Orso is saying he's going to be doing this, he's going to try and make an impact on the world, my thoughts are, this is not going to happen. There's no way this is going to happen. And when it seemed like it did, I was shocked. But having it fall apart just after makes it hurt so much more than if Orso had failed from the beginning. Yeah, how devastating was that when he comes out and all the people that he thought he had saved are just hung? <laughs> Yeah, just, and he can't do anything about it. it. It was an awful feeling, which is a, actually a good thing to happen in, in a book like this. It's supposed to make you feel awful. Oh, man. It's, it's a unique taste, we'll say, are these books. <laughs> I will say uh, you brought up the politics point. I think there were a few things in this book that really seemed really relevant to today in 2020. And I think the idea of politics going nowhere and making zero progress seems really kind of top of mind with a lot of issues. I think there were some other things like uh, when they talk about the union being a melting pot and all these other cultures coming in and that's the strength of the union. I think that is obviously a big social point right now. Um, There were some like statues that were being toppled for different reasons, but it seemed like some of these things were like really almost too relevant to today did you get that at all yeah they they're a little on the nose but not in a way that i think will age poorly uh toppling statues is something that's like definitely happening now in our recent time but has happened in the past as well like yeah. i'm sure when the soviet union fell they were pulling down statues at that time so i agree that there are a lot of parallels and it's like a little weird to be reading it now, but I don't think it's going to age poorly. Unlike like um, a meme reference, it's not something that people are going to understand in a couple of years and it will age poorly. It'll be just a weird thing in the book. While these parallels are present, I think they're done well and will not like age the book at all. Agreed. Agreed 100%. I was actually watching an interview that Abercrombie did with Daniel Green today. And one of the questions he had for him was, man, it seems like a lot of the things in your books are really relevant today. Like, is that planned? Is that just something that kind of naturally happened? Are you trying to make a point here? And he kind of said that he he recognizes that and he doesn't want anything to be too on the nose. But at the same time, he he said that the 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 relevancy there was important to the to the series although he did want to make sure that there wasn't anything that was too obvious and and would end up trending on twitter maybe <laughs> this book was written and published in 2019 so they seem on the nose but i i think they might have just been like a reference that he made that wasn't really geared towards today's politics or issues I think it happened a little bit before that yeah. started. Yeah, and he he talked about that as well. Just you know, the writing process obviously years away from what from when we actually have the books in our hand. Okay, any other plot points that you feel it's essential we talk about? I did want to talk through some themes and just kind of some fun things from the book too. The only other thing I would mention is the Battle of the Red Hill. We we've kind of already touched on it, but really the implications for that in the north. We haven't talked about as much. Now, Stour has taken control of the North. It almost seems like he wants to ally with the Union and develop a better relationship, but he's also a ruthless killer. So I'm not sure which way that's going to go in the future. Yeah, it just anything that's good or peaceful happening seems so unsettling. We cannot trust this, especially with the next book being called The Trouble with Peace, and there is now peace between the North and the, the Union, you think, oh, that might be troublesome, and we may not have that peace for very long. I, I think we might be a little jaded about anything good happening to characters in this book. We've mentioned that like four or five times now. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Yeah, Abercrombie definitely knows his brand, and as a reader, you kind of know it as well by this time. Yeah, I think that was it for plots. If you want to move on to themes... So one thing I liked a lot about this book were all of the references, not only to the previous series, but to just kind of other things in general. And and one that really stood out to me was some nods to A Song of Ice and Fire. 
somewhere real on the nose, like with the wolf fighting the lion. Like these are two animals that can never seem to get along in the whole incest plot line. Um, I like, I like stuff like this where it's not explicitly called out that it's referencing this other thing, but at the same time, it's kind of like Abercrombie giving a thumbs up over to, uh, to Martin who kind of really introduced this whole grimdark genre. Yeah. Like, just like you said, this is a nice homage. It's not, it's not really picking, picking up plot points from game of Thrones and taking them over here. It's just a homage saying, Hey, I see you. I take my inspiration from you, but I'm moving in a new direction. So I think it's really great that when authors do this, they make a nod towards the past, recognize their influences. There's a lot. I know Sanderson does a lot of Wheel of Time type things like this. They're pretty buried, but they are there. And if you uh, if you like Dresden Files, he always has tons of pop culture references, and a lot are from Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and and things like that. So um, it's always nice to see authors give props to the guys that helped him out. So other than these cameos to, or other than these references, I really liked all the cameos to the main trilogy. We kind of talked about this a little bit, the main trilogy and the previous standalones, etc. Some people on Reddit that I've seen think it's too much and thought that we needed to move the plot past all of this and just like wipe the slate clean and move forward with these characters. They felt like a lot of the characters were just kind of copies of previous characters and it didn't really do it for them. I wholeheartedly disagree with that statement, maybe because I really like Easter eggs and I love when I'm able to make connections and feel smart and pick up on things. So that's just like a little benefit to me as a reader that Joe is throwing in there. So between those two opinions, where do you fall? Oh, I am more with you. Um, I think that it would be impossible to ignore these characters. 30 years in the future is not that far in the future. So it would be weird for Glockta not to be there and influencing the plot. It'd be weird for Giselle not to make some small impact. It would be super weird for Baez and the other mages to not still be influencing the world. So just with the way the world is set up and how little relative time has passed between the first and this trilogy, I don't mind these characters showing up. And they're characters that I enjoy reading, just like you said. Call Shivers is a great character, and it's nice to see him, even for this small bit of time, still alive, still fighting, still being a badass. And I just really appreciate that, like the follow through and seeing where these characters are going. It felt a little like, and maybe this this analogy may not be popular, but it felt a little like the latest Star Wars trilogy, Disney's trilogy, where we had Han and Luke and Leia, and they're still around, but they're not the main characters anymore, but they're still there influencing the main plot line. So love it or hate it, I, that's the analogy that I drew, and I'm with you. I, I love to see these guys. Um, a, a few others that you're probably not as familiar with um, without the, the hero's knowledge, but I really liked Finry's development in this one. She and and Calder as well. They are both, well, they're both introduced in the heroes and you get to see how clever they are. And then to see them respectively, you know, leading the different sides in this battle is a, is a very nice payoff from that, sp- from that book. So there's a lot of real nice, payoffs that this allows you to do by bringing the previous characters and i love it i'm on board for this 100 percent. yeah just like you said i think it's even a little bit less on the nose than the star wars cameos they're they're still present still influencing the plot but they're not a focus anymore even beyond just the cameos there are some really fun like direct quotes from the first book that come over into this one one example there there are several but one that i'll pull from is when rika meets Baez for the first time when they're coming into adua she has literally the same exact conversation that logan has with Baez when they are coming into adua almost word for word when Baez is talking about how many people live in adua and how 
massive a city it is. And then, like, then he spreads his arm out wide and he says, you know, welcome to glorious Adua, which is basically, you know, everything that he's worked for. It's literally the same exact conversation. So stuff like that, it's really fun and you may not pick up on it, but if you do, then you feel smart and you love it. Yeah, that conversation is the same down to, I remember when the three farms was three farms. Like it's so yeah, good. And yeah. Even other characters come in, like there are lines all the time that I think are attributed to Bloody Nine. Well, that I attribute to Bloody Nine. Like one is, well, you have to be realistic, not lost forever. Even if it's not something the Bloody Nine said directly, that's something that he would say. Uh-huh. So I love the influence of the old characters and these callbacks. It's the same thing from before. I appreciate the callbacks. One fantastic line, based on what you're saying about the Bloody Nine, is when Rika meets Jazal and Jazal, Jazal says, oh, you're the Dogman's daughter. The Dogman was friends with my friend, the Bloody Nine. And then Rika says, oh, you have to be realistic because like that's the line that she knows attributed to the Bloody Nine. And stuff like that is, is awesome. She also, when meeting Baez, says, oh, you're a wizard. I thought you'd have a staff, which is the same hilarious thing that Logan says to Baez back in The Blade Itself. Yeah. Okay, so let's close here talking where we think the series is going to go from here. There are some prophecies that haven't necessarily been fulfilled all the way. There are definitely some unanswered questions, as you would expect, after an initial book of a trilogy. So prophecy-wise, Ricka says, I saw a wolf eat the sun, then a lion ate the wolf, then a lamb ate the lion, then an owl ate the lamb. If you can follow all those creatures, we kind of know what some of these things mean. Like it seems like nightfall is the wolf and the lion is Leo. The lamb and the owl are maybe a little more open to conjecture. The the lamb is Orso. And that's what you would think think they do call him start to call him the young lamb at the end of the book there is one other person who could be the lamb but if you haven't read red country yet i am not going to say who that is oh Um, i would would recommend i would recommend reading it I'll, i'll just say i don't agree with that theory for the record but it's a fun possibility we may see another character come back in, uh, is, is what we'll say. Interesting. So, th- so that's possible. Um, as far as the owl, are we thinking Baez, right? Maybe? I think Baez might be a little too on the nose. I see it, definitely. Like, that's definitely a possibility. Maybe uh, Savine could be the owl. If we're saying, like, the lion takes the power from the wolf, so Leo defeated Nightfall, and then Orso is going to somehow defeat Leo... And then maybe Savine comes back in. And then the, the the other thought here is that it could be Rika because of the long eye and the potential wisdom being granted to her and the vengeance path the, the vengeance path that she's been set upon could be her. I kind of like that one. Like you say, Baez does seem really on the nose. But if anyone's gonna be an owl, it's probably Baez. Yeah. So we'll see. Okay, how about this one where Rika sees a weaver? And a woman with her head stitched together with gold. I have theories on these ones. Okay, why don't you lay them out for me? Because I I remember that there was a family of weavers, but I don't remember how important that character was. So they talk about weavers in like the sense of the profession, and there is the weaver who is the leader of the Breaker Burner group that we don't know who that is necessarily. I'm going to say that the weaver in this one is probably Baez because of like pin pulling strings and the woman with her head stitched together with gold kind of sounds like Monza, right? Her head was shaved and she had the gold coins getting her skull back together. Yeah, I, I definitely see that her head stitched together with gold. Hmm. But why would Baez team up with her? And I don't necessarily know that these are, this was a really vague vision. So they may not be on the same side. And that would be surprising. Yeah. I guess we'll see on that one. Yeah. Maybe that could be the uh, bank. There was another quote from Reich. I saw a weaver. Oh, I think the weaver has like endless pockets that never empty, right? Pockets that never empty. So maybe that's the bank. 
Just referring to Valentin Balk yeah. in general. Yeah. And then one other notable prophecy for, from her was at the very end, she sees a chieftain dead with men gathered around wondering what they can gain from him. Seems like she thinks it's her father, but then Giselle dies right afterwards and Scale dies as well. So this one's totally open for, could, could be anyone. I kind of think it's Giselle. I, I would see Giselle as well. Less less likely Dogman. Scale is also a good one. We have Clover standing there where Scale is dead, wondering what he can gain from it. So that is a possibility. But Giselle makes a lot more sense to me uh, because the stories of the First Law are kind of focused on the Union because that's where Baez is focused. So who is, Alex, who is the Weaver? The leader, the the guy pulling the strings, the guy that... The guy that Malmer saw briefly and was about to tell Vic something about before Pike led him away. Any theories here? So I think Baez is too obvious, but obviously still an option. I want to say a rival, a rival mage to Baez, one that we haven't met yet. If I was going to make a guess, that would be it. He says he's been off in the West dealing with some business, or that's at least what Sulfur says. And... This is hinted a little bit in Red Country. He's got this brother named Zacharis. I think he was also around in the original trilogy. He's kind of dealing with the fallout there. So that could be a possibility. My theory, I don't necessarily think that this is true, but I think it would be fun, is what if it's Pike himself? Like He silences Malmer right at the right time. No one's ever seen his face, which is important because Pike is obviously super recognizable and this guy would have a reason to be against the union like maybe he's been harboring this grudge for years and years and years and he's finally set things up i think it's a little far-fetched but i think it would be fun i could definitely see that that's it's an interesting one probably a little more interesting than mine rather than two mages fighting we have (laughs) a real person (laughs) yeah abercrombie doesn't do much of like the big wizard battle other than the end of last argument of kings Yes. Were you surprised that Gurkle was pretty much just like written out thus far? I was fairly surprised. I I was a little bit because they had just such a huge impact on the f- first series, first trilogy. But I think that the Eaters are going to come back into focus. What is Savine's like servant's name who was gone for most of the book? Her name, I think, is Zuri from... She's from Gurkle, right? Yeah, so you're, 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 you just reminded me, Zuri. Her brothers, I think one of them is an eater who's come to the Union. They talk about his wide, toothy smile. And every time I see that, I, I think of the eaters ah. because of uh, sulfur. I had not heard that theory. Interesting. Okay. I mean, she's picking up... Dudes from Gurkle, who she says are her brothers, with little explanation offered, and it's totally off camera. I could see it. Yeah. I like that one. Do you think that Pharaoh will return at all in the series? Because it seems like it's been hinted that Pharaoh is the reason for all the unrest. Like she went in and killed Mamun, and that's why it's no longer a thing. That's what she went off to do at the end of the first trilogy. Do you think we'll see Pharaoh again? No, I think that what you said is the end of her tale. She got her vengeance, and I I would be a little surprised if we saw her again, actually, because her we know what her end was. However, she did also want to get vengeance on the lying bald pink that caused her so much angst. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. I uh, I don't know. I, I still kind of think that she's done. Uh, we won't see her again. Do you think we'll see Logan? Logan, yes. Uh, maybe in a similar state to Clover. Not having much impact. A little more grizzled. He's going to be fairly old at this point now, like 60s. So I don't expect him to have a huge impact, but I wouldn't be surprised if we saw an old man with nine fingers or something like that. Just briefly and like one person recognizes him or they see a hand and it's it's missing a finger and that's him yeah exactly i could see that i I could not see him being a main part of the plot 
added in, like randomly added in the second book. That doesn't work for me, so, but I could see a brief cameo, possibly. I, I kind of don't think so, though, but we'll see. Couple more questions for you. Who killed Jazal? Who do you think, who did the, the deed? Long live the king. Yeah, for this one, I'm going to go with the obvious Baez. He's he's decided that Giselle has lived out his usefulness. They were seen talking at the feast before Giselle was killed. And it's, yeah, didn't seem like it was uh, going well. That conversation wasn't going well for Giselle. So I'm going to go with the obvious Baez on this one. I'm going to say so as well, especially since he died under such mysterious circumstances and the way that Baez put his hand on his corpse and said long live the king and looked at Orso and just Baez coming in and making these changes it seems so obvious to the point where it must be the case I mean yeah. Abercrombie definitely puts twists into his books but sometimes it just is right yeah and I think we could see a reason why like Giselle is not popular with the people he's kind of outlived his usefulness he was made king because he was popular, because Baez could use him to gain support from the union for what he wanted. And now that he's out of favor, he needs a new popular person to lead the union the way he wants. Agreed. Okay, going forward into the trouble with peace, I think we kind of talked through most of the points that I wanted to hit on. Going to the next book, is there anything you expect to happen that we haven't talked about yet? Any like plot beats that seem like they must be going on or, or theories or anything like that? So we, we already kind of mentioned that we think there's going to be more struggle or conflict in the North. I think it would be just startling if there wasn't. One thing that we haven't touched on yet, though, is I think there's going to be a rival to Orso for the throne. I'm not sure who it is, but him just getting the throne without challenge doesn't seem like a possibility whether it's leo who comes to challenge him or savine eventually i I think that somebody is going to have to challenge him for that they've hinted at savine's desires to be the queen and glockta saying you know you're the real firstborn i could see it i think leo will be a rival for him but maybe not directly for the throne maybe just more of a political rival based off the popularity that he has already as the hero and you saw this rivalry in their parade where everyone was cheering for Leo and everyone was booing for Orso and then this setup with these other young lords who have these more kind of revolutionary ideas and they're kind of taking him in that's where I see Leo going but I don't see Leo handling any of this well maybe kind of like bumbling along and getting some help from other sources and and making some waves for sure. I wonder if Leo and Savine are to stay paired together. Savine obviously just using him for his popularity to get herself more power, but that could be an interesting way for this series to go. Yeah, it would have to be Savine using him. I'm really interested to see where Savine goes. I think she's going to reach further than just her investment ambitions. I kind of think she she may like will she make a play for the throne or will she just decide that she needs power no matter what she I, she's going further she's going to be more ruthless that's pretty obvious yeah and I don't know if the world of first law is ready to accept a female in charge of the union yet even though she would probably be the most effective I just, I'm not sure that the culture is accepting of it. Yeah, that would be interesting. There were a small, a few like little feminist beats where characters said things like, oh, you know, if I was a man, this wouldn't be happening. Or, you know, this is only happening, be, you know, be, because of my position in society, which I thought were nice little beats to throw in there. And it also kind of hinted at, hey, this is a revolution in more than just industry. It's also a revolution in, in ideas and society and enlightenment in general. We do have Monza being in charge of Styria, but her son is really the king. You actually see this real briefly in a short story in Sharpens where they crown her son 
So I could see that. Like it may be tough to accept a, a queen as the sole power. Yeah, there are hints though that they're becoming more accepting with Leo's mother organizing that battle in the north so well and taking command and succeeding. Leo has the final blow, but her plan was definitely seen as masterful and she is definitely viewed as a capable general. They mentioned that she is the best general in the Union at that time. So right. I, I think that the Union is going to change, and it wouldn't surprise me if they were accepting of Savine on the throne by the end of this trilogy. I'm all for that. Savine's my girl. <laughs> if, as long as she can get it together. No more pearl dust. Enough of that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> For me, going into the next book and the end of the series, I'm just interested to see if things will ever change, if this cycle will change. We have a clear passing of the torch from the previous leaders down to our current point of view characters and heroes of sorts. But with Baez back in the picture, we know he's really in charge. Will things change ever? Like, Will Baez be unseated somehow, or will he just continue to move things along steadily and pull strings and kill people heartlessly knowing it's an Abercrombie book. You kind of think that like it'll end in a satisfying, but unsettling way. And I, I don't see Baez losing power. I think he continues to, I think there's a nice conversation with him at a checkerboard at the end of the series. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, I don't know. I could see him being pulled down and replaced by something worse or at least as bad as he is. Because we, we know that the magic is leaving the world. It's it's mentioned in the first trilogy and in this trilogy again. It's harder and harder for him to use his magic. So I could, I could see him being pulled down, but I can't see him being replaced with something better. It almost seems like if Abercrombie writes out Baez by the end of the series then he would need to be done with first law books because without that tension of thinking that nothing is ever gonna go right it would be very strange (laughs) yeah even though Baez isn't the main character of any of the books I think he's definitely the the focus point of the series so it'd be weird to continue on without him yeah that's that's where the conflict really stems from Okay, I think that's a wrap for A Little Hatred. We both love this one. Like I said, this is my favorite that I've read this year so far. We'll see if that stands by the end because we do have a large tome coming out from one Brandon Sanderson that may end up being my favorite. But this one, obviously very solid. And I'm I'm looking forward to Trouble with Peace. Who knows? Maybe Trouble with Peace becomes the, the, the best book of 2020. Yeah, we'll have to see. Uh, kind of like you, I'm really looking forward to Rhythm of War, but Trouble with Peace is definitely something I'm looking forward to as well. I got to go back and read The Heroes and Sharp Ends, apparently. And I, Red I Country. Really like the series. Def- definitely also read Red Country. Yes. There's not quite as much, but there's some there's some important things. Yeah. Okay, Alex, let, let everyone know one more time um, about A Hero's Journey and where they can find you guys. Yeah, so uh, again, we're... A Hero's Journey podcast. You can find us on Spotify, um, iTunes, all of the major services. Uh, there are a couple of different Hero's Journey, Hero's Journey podcasts, so it might be easier to find us on social media. You can find us on Twitter at A underscore Heroes underscore Journey or on Facebook at A Hero's Journey Pod. And if you like Phantology, you can find us at www.phantologybooks.com on your internet browser plug that in. That'll bring up all of our episodes and social media links, etc. You can also find us on Twitter. We do some fun things like we're running a top fantasy artifacts Twitter poll for the month of September. So if you'd like to join in that, uh, please do just uh, ping us or comment on any of our Twitter posts. And then if you want to chat with us more and let us know the thing that we missed from this episode, which is probably something, and tell us how dumb we are, then join our Discord invites for that will be on episode postings and on our social media and website and and that's that's a fun time um there's always some good conversation with like-minded fantasy nerds so alex thank you so much for joining me this has been a great conversation 
Uh, this is going to be perfect timing for this episode as people get hyped for the trouble with peace. I know I'm already hyped. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me on. This is awesome. And I am as hyped as you are. I can't wait to see what Abercrombie does with the series. Fantastic. All right. See everyone next time. Bye.